for children aged five and seven. And um, one of them is home. The other one's at a class. And uh, we really just welcome on every PAL call, we say, all sounds and signs of life. So in your space, if there's any noise, whether it's construction or other people or pets, um, children, people you're caring for, please don't censor yourself or feel like you have to edit yourself out of the conversation because we're honored to be a part of your space and we will commit to listening um, with all the sounds that you are hearing in your space as well. And so I'd love to pass it on to Tamanya, my amazing colleague. <laughs> hello, hello. Also, as I pull mine up, um, I'm coming to you. My name is Tamanya Garza. I am locally the um, chief rep of Philadelphia for PAL, and I am the national director of. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, sorry. My landing dog just disappeared. Um, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> the national director of community and justice initiatives. Uh, I am coming to you in the land of the Lenape Lenape people, whose historical territory includes the places colonially known as Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Long Island, and the Lower Hudson Valley. For more than 10,000 years, the Lenape people have been stewards of these lands, as well as the River of Human Beings or the Delaware River. Over the past 250 years, many of the, the Lenape people were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands and dispersed throughout the country, though some families remain. These families continue the traditions of their ancestors to this day, the violence that removed the Lenape people from their homeland is a powerful part of the history of Pennsylvania, and we acknowledge that in this moment, and we work and live on these very lands. This is the story of our entire country. We encourage you to learn about the lands where you live and work and history of the people who lived there before colonization, many of who still live there today. Though they are often starved of the very resources they protected for so long, including access to housing, sustainable food practices, safety, clean water, and the land where they once lived with their families. This information was provided in part by www.lenape-nation.org. Um, I am coming to you from Philadelphia and uh, I would, my pronouns are she, her. And uh, just for anyone that needs a description, I am a caramel skin colored human with dark hair. I am plus size. I have bright eyes and a giant smile. Um, yeah, so that's us. Awesome. And whenever we have these conversations, um, it's such a pleasure uh, to collaborate with Tamania on this. Um, we love to have conversations with um, the thoughts that are in the room. Um, we will have resources that we're sharing with everyone. Uh, but first, I would love to invite everyone to type into the chat um, your name and where you're hailing from um, and the land acknowledgement, if you know it. Um, we'd also love to invite you to share a bit about um, uh, what you're looking for when it comes to the first thing that came to your mind when you knew this class was uh, available. Thank you so much, Christy. I appreciate you acknowledging the noise in your space, which welcome. Amazing. We'll let a couple more people um, fill the chat. Um, as I was sharing a bit uh, about myself, I am a parent to two children, ages five and seven. Um, and when I started this work, I was very much invisible parenting, which is um, doing my very best to pull myself up by my bootstraps and make it work as an actor. I'm an actor by trade. And um, I thought that the best way to go about this work would be to um, audition and book jobs and make it look uh, in the postpartum life exactly or easier than it was uh, prepartum. Um, and so I just want to speak that into the space as a reality that many people face in addition to um, other realities such as caring for elders, caring for siblings, other family members and friends. Um, and so if you have a story that 
um, is your story or a story that's familiar that you are interested in supporting, um, we will definitely be making space to share that as well. Um, and that's a bit about my origin story that uh, it used to be invisible, uh, that I created my own access, so I thought. So I'll just leave an ellipsis there, what happened after. And is it Jasmine or Jasmine? Remind me. I would love to learn your name. It's Jasmine. Jasmine, thank you so much. Um, amazing. We really appreciate those of you who are coming to support as allies. Mm. Welcome. Thank you, Gloria, for sharing all those ways that you care for others in your life and yourself. Um, great. And as, as we let that, oh, great. Hello, Hannah. Is it Hannah or Hannah? I would guess Hannah, but I love to learn people's names. <laughs> You can share later though, as your first one, Hannah. Thank you. Um, yes, sculptor installation. I love it. And hello to your toddler as well. We welcome it all to the space. Um, wonderful. Um, Tamanya, what comes to your mind when you think of a caregiver space, what it used to be and what it, what it could be now? Um, so to give you a little history or to give everyone who doesn't know me that, hello, hello. <laughs> These are our pal welcome hands for all, all of the little ones that join us. <laughs> um, to, to give you a little information, I am a director by trade. I have been directing in Philly for 21 years and um, I have a little one and um, I don't share their name uh, or gender or age or anything on the internet, but I refer to them as Spider-Man. So Spider-Man needs to swing in here and protect us from anything. Just know we're in good hands. Um, so I care for Spider-Man and I also uh, care for, I have cared for older parents and continue to care for um, one older parent. My father passed away uh, almost a year, well, a year and a half ago. So um, I, I'm a member of the Samish generation. So what I think of uh, when it comes to my mind when I think of that conversation is I too, I thought when uh, I had a little one uh, that I would no longer be able to do what I do, I direct. And I thought that having a little one and the way that would impact my schedule and my ability to be present for things would make me seem unreliable. So I literally kept it a secret. I stopped going to shows and I stopped um, taking on new projects. And I just assumed I would be out of the game for about five years um, because I plan to nurse and do all these other things with my little one. And um, thankfully I met Powell really early on in my journey and that was not the case. I met Rachel and it opened up this space where being a parent artist was an asset. But I definitely think before I felt like it was going to knock me out of my entire career. And now I feel like it is a way to build community and to support each other and to learn how different everyone's caregiving journey is, especially caregiving for parents as well as kids um, and a parent with a disability. Uh, so I think that what it can be now is a place where um, I am my most true self. And as a, as a director and a world builder, I gain new skills every day as a parent. That's what it means for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna jump into one of our uh, favorite principles for dialogue here at PAL, which is actually a first resource. Um, and while I do that, I'd love to invite everyone to, and these don't have to be full sentences, but type into the chat the first thing that comes to mind when you think of either something that you wish people knew about the caregiver artist experience or something that surprised you to discover if you're an ally. Um, so something you wish people knew or something that surprised you. Hello, I'm so happy you're here on this call. Would you like to say hello, Calvin? Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so happy to be included. Oh, thrilled. Um, and if you would like to share, you can share your favorite thing to do. What's the most fun thing to do? We'd love to see that in the chat. So for our caregivers, it's um, 
something you wish people knew about the caregiver artist experience. For our allies, it's something that surprised you. And for our new friends joining us, just beginning their life journey, your favorite thing to do. Gaming, good call. I bet you're really good at it. Bet you're really good. Um, so one of the, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that, um, Calvin, you're welcome to share anytime, by the way. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we teach institutions and organizations, people who have uh, decision-making capabilities and hold, hold power in, in our institutions and in our structures um, is to ask the question, what do you need? Um, and the reason why is because at PAL, we believe that our solutions exist in the stories of our need. And that's why we love to start these conversations talking about what we wish people knew about this experience. Um, when Pal first started, the very first year was dedicated to motherhood specifically and breaking the silence. And a huge reason why is because one of the greatest barriers, it had been even proven in this great research study called Women Leadership in Lort Resident Theaters, chapter nine is on family life in the workplace. And the researchers concluded that there is um, a stigma that enforces silence. It was done in theater around caregiving and prevents people from talking about it because of the potential consequences. Now that silence is one of the, the hugest fact, factors that have prevented our solutions from taking hold. And so we believe by simply speaking what we need, we develop solutions from that. So inviting you all to share um, what you wish people knew or what surprised you um, is part of being a part of the solutions that make us feel we can let go of the burden of shame of having needs and really engage with the empowerment that comes from speaking our needs out loud because we're actually part of solutions building when we do that. Um, so I'd love to read some of these in the chat. Um, one of the things that surprised Jasmine is that um, Jasmine could support friends with children with babysitter cost and it be well received. Yes, I love that. I love that. What a friend engagement. Um, the economic reality that impacts how we develop relationships, right? Finances are relationships in our world. Um, the biggest surprise was just how thoroughly exhausting the job of caregiving is, especially without immediately present network of family close by. So real that there's nothing that taxes in the same way. Um, it is consuming. Again, um, how exhausting the life and death element of caregiving, especially for elders with disabilities, can be, and how much had to be learned to navigate the healthcare system. 100%. Um, it was surprising to learn that so many caregivers felt compelled to interrupt their careers because of the barriers that were raised that disinvited them from continuing work. Oof. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for typing that in the chat so that we could speak it out loud. Um, to a person, uh, even for the folks with privilege that could continue their careers, I don't know a single person that didn't have a moment of doubt when it came to making those decisions or didn't have to weigh the cost. And when we start talking about cost that goes beyond just finances, which, you know, as we saw in the chat, is a huge impact. We're talking about systemic barriers. We're talking about cultural barriers, um, racism, misogyny, et cetera. Um, and the, I, love, I love the language here um, that disinvited them from continuing to work. It, it was almost an automatic repercussion. Um, so I'd love to invite Tamanya to share a bit about um, what some of those barriers are and what comes up for people all across the the spectrum of, of privilege so that we can all engage with these experiences in the context of, and not just myself, but then also. Um, thank you for that, Rachel. I think, uh, as you mentioned, you know, all of those barriers are huge. I think first and foremost, certainly um, for a Latin A caregiver, um, I, I make as a Latin A woman, uh, I'm Mexican American, 50 cents on the dollar to what a white artist in my position would make. And so that means I start off with half the resources in terms of money, and I have to spend twice as much time just to get where a white artist would be. Um, and that is a that is a federal statistic, so that's not something that I created. Um, 
so I think there's that there's there's the fact that uh, you, we already start with so many so many financial burdens that we're usually already working two jobs just to work in theater often. Um, I think another thing is just the perception. Um, it's already very very hard to be a successful director who is a um, who is femme or femme presenting. Um, because there's so much misogyny, misogyny that's just systemic in every industry, and ours is no exception. Theater is no exception. Um, so the fact that you just getting into the position, just getting your name spoken in the rooms uh, by the people who have the power to gatekeep opportunities is huge. Um, and then the perception that as a parent, I, I always say, I didn't even know most of the people who were parents in theater that I knew personally were parents because it is something that was kept so far from their theater life so, so they could still seem employable. Um, and so just knowing that they were in secret, I, I felt like, I, and not that they were all keeping it a secret, some are very forthcoming, but um, that so many felt that pressure. I, I was concerned that I would be perceived as flaky or not dedicated enough or that my, um, you know, disruptive, like having to leave to nurse, having to leave to care for my um, father who was ill. And so all of those things combined um, just felt insurmountable. It just felt like my career was over for a while or possibly over forever um, because it was already so hard to do the work that once you add the exhaustion and the time that it takes to parent, um, I thought I was just out. I thought all of the work I had done was just, I was just going to backslide and I wouldn't even be in conversations anymore. Um, and and I, I know a lot of people feel that way. And especially when you add other things, you know, for people who have disabilities or people who, you know, have other challenges that already make it difficult. Um, it, again, caregiving can just, in terms of the time it takes, in terms of the exhaustion level, it can just make it feel when you're on the front end, not understanding what the reality would be, it just can make it seem like there will, there, this is not a mountain I can climb. There's no way. And in reality, what I found is that parents move mountains literally every day to get to that work and to get to that, to get to that place where they can both juggle parenting or caregiving and art. And they are some of the most powerful and incredible artists I know. 100%. Thank you so much, Tamania. And thank you all for sharing into the chat. Um, what we've found is that by speaking these things out loud and by reframing them as assets, we're also gonna be talking about ways that we can um, advocate, not just on a larger, uh, larger plane for our field, for you know the organizations that we interact with, but also on an individual level. Um, Jasmine mentioned one of the things that um, uh, that we had talked about on our prep call that that actually became something personally applicable. Um, what I would love for folks to share in the chat now is uh, a moment when, even if you're not a caregiver, um, a moment when someone. Uh, who interacted with you during your um, ar artistic uh, commission or um, during a job, someone showed you support and what that support was. I would love for everyone to share into the chat a moment when they felt, oh, this is it. It could be something someone said, you know, something as relational as and personal as that. It could be something um, as institutional as they provided plane tickets for me and my whole family. Like that's a pretty large and, and radical thing. Um, so um, I'm gonna let the chat populate there. Um, and I'm gonna share uh, a couple examples <laughs> from my own life and then invite Tamani to share as well um, that are in contrast. So um, the first, my first uh, Broadway uh, callback, um, one of my first Broadway callbacks um, is uh, I was up until two in the morning the night before, because of course I found out that day that I had uh, five pages of sides to learn for the next day. Um, and my daughter was just around one years old and I had traveled into New York City from Philadelphia. So I'm staying in my brother's apartment, not even my apartment. My infant daughter is sleeping in the middle of this large bed, very against all pedia pediatrician recommendations. And I'm sitting on the floor. And instead of studying my lines, 
I'm texting friends in the middle of the night, knowing I'm waking them up, asking, can anyone watch my daughter at this time? I will buy you lunch. I will do literally anything. And the exhaustion that came not only from losing sleep, um, because, you know, as artists, like we're used to the rigor, right? Um, we, sometimes we confuse lack of access with rigor of, oh, this is my sacrifice. This is, this is part of the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into it. But actually what it was was a lack of community and a lack of support. And I'm there texting people saying, is there anyone out there? I ended up hearing from someone who knew someone who could babysit the next day. Um, I have called in friends to, to help out before, but I found out around two in the morning. And then I was left with the rest of the night to do my best with my lines and to wake up as though I were rested and to show up at that audition as though none of that existed. And I felt that that was my task, that that was my job as a professional um, to appear as though access wasn't necessary, but that I was self-sufficient and capable and I could appear uh, as though summoned um, with everything taken care of perfectly, whatever the cost. Uh, I booked the job. So this is also not one of those stories where it's like loaded with self-doubt. I, it was such a proof of my capabilities and it was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had professionally. But I look back on that time and I wonder what then could I have been capable of if there was a network of support, if there was a community, if the people in charge with the power to tell me what to learn, where to be, what to be wearing, what to be saying, what accent to be using also said, and here's some resources if you need access, not just for caregiving, but for travel, but for time slots. Do you have another job or are you traveling two and a half hours one way for three minutes in the room? These questions that power can be asking that we as people who are still um, at, at its mercy to a certain extent, able to at least let go of when it comes to our own self-possession of shame and responsibility for compensating for that lack of access. How can we find those memories and let go of what we blamed ourselves for before and reframe what we expect in the future? is my offer there. And then in contrast, years later, 2019, right? My daughter is six, no, five at this point. <laughs> the pandemic years like don't compute with math for me. So 2019, um, we are driving to Hartford, Connecticut. And I have a job at Hartford stage and we're driving from Philadelphia. So it's a four and a half hour drive. My babysitter cancels and I'm driving to the first day of rehearsal and I will get there right on time for the day to start. And I have two children now and no one to watch them for an entire day of rehearsal for a lead role that I'm so excited about. And I love, um, two factors are different here. One, the play is about motherhood. So there's a conversation around it already talking about like, how have we been made invisible by content is a branch that we can go with this conversation. And then also by this point, PAL had been started, a network had been created. I had developed relationships with colleagues like Tamanya who are also my mentors to a certain extent of understanding how do we engage with language when asking for what we need? How can we expect that from others while giving them the benefit of the doubt? And as I very dangerously had texted and tried to find sitters on my way, I knew who in that organization was a parent who was ready to advocate for me because of this network. It still makes me emotional to this day. And I reached out to them and I said, I have no one I'm about to show up with two kids and a car loaded with all my stuff so that I can live in your city for three months. And I literally have no one and they're five and three. They're not like, they could sit in the corner. I bet they could, but not for the entire day. And the, the director and the general manager who are both moms and part of this network said, we've got you. And within 30 minutes so that I could pay attention to driving and getting my kids there safely, they reached out to me and said that they had found someone who was interning, who had been, who had like been babysitting in the community, who they knew really well. And they had set aside the rehearsal room next door to ours. And they're going to be bringing toys so that by the time I got there, there would be someone to meet me where I was literally. And I show up with my children and with my readiness to contribute to this organization. And there was someone to greet me 
with support. And my kids had an amazing day playing with this incredible person. And I had an amazing rehearsal. But the rest that came from, I had done literally everything I could. There was nothing that I could have done further to prepare myself. It's not about being professional. It's not about being better at your job. It's not about thinking ahead. I had done it all and it still fell through. And then there was someone there to meet me. And that is an example of a solution that that's not necessarily written in policy. It should be, we started working with them, but like, how can we create that? How does all that? But it's an example of our stories of our solutions exist in the stories of our need because I had found a community where we had shared so much about the access that we would need to feel supported that by the time I said I need this thing they knew how to respond immediately with we have this thing <laughs> that can help you um so yeah I just I would love to invite you all to share into the chat an example of support or if you're having a hard time um finding an example of support, a time when you did need support. Um, you can either come up with the support that you needed or say, I don't even know what, what I could have asked for, but here's a moment when I needed that. Um, and I'd love to invite Tamanya to share anything that this, this topic prompts um, from her experiences. Um, and thank you for that, Rachel. I know it's, it can be very emotional to remember those moments when you felt like there was no safety net and you were falling and then someone met you, like you said, where you were. Um, I have, I think I have a, a few, I, um, you know, just real quick, one of the first is one of the first shows I did back was um, a show called Las Mujeres with um, Power Street Theater Company here in Philadelphia, which is a run by a cohort of incredible women and um, just the support was phenomenal. It was a new play and it was a play uh, in part about motherhood. And I remember um, the conversations weren't always like, how can we add support for you as a parent? It was, we're, we're adding support for you because you're a parent, please guide us on that journey. How do we do that? So like we offered um, childcare at every single performance, you know, no, no barriers. Like people could literally bring children. They could sit in the very next room. We were in this gorgeous um, space, the West Kensington ministry uh, in Ken the Kensington part of Philadelphia and people could literally just come as they were. They could, they could tell us they were coming or not and just put them in the next room. I remember, um, the, the, I didn't live too, too far away. And I would say, okay, if you want me here for uh, the sort of late night talkbacks and things like that, I, I, you know, I may need to nurse. I may need to go home and put my little one to bed. And it was literally like, of course we'll perform. You run home and do that. You come back when you're done. And, and, you know, just all of that. I remember having my little one in the space a few times just to look at the set, to check everything out. So I, I just remember the conversation starting with, um, we're going to support you, tell us how, instead of me having to start the conversation of, I need help, please, you know, please support me. And the, the weight off my mind, the ability to focus on my job that was so much different because I knew that already existed was incredible. So thank you to all of the gorgeous people at Power Street. Um, to Gabby and Anjali and Asaki and Alina and Deanna um, for, and, and Crystal and all of the other people because they're, you know, centering that was incredible. Um, and I think the second time was when I was working on uh, Cry It Out, which I directed at um, Sympatico Theater and the incredible Allison Heishman. And I see heads nodding because we, we know what an ally she is. Um, she asked me to direct Cry It Out while I was still sort of on my I can't direct hiatus. And long story short, she came to me and said, what do you need? And I gave her a laundry list and she said, yes, yes. And how can we meet this? How can we do this? And that was it every step of the way. It was, there was never um, pushback. There was never, you know, like, oh, I, I don't know. It was always like, you need it and we're going to get it. And I don't know how today, but I will know tomorrow. And I think, um, and, and their budget is not large at Sympatico. They did not have some wealth of resources, um, but with a, a grant from PAL, an institutional grant for the show, we were order, able to provide um, child care on site during tech, uh, stipends for caregivers. Um, we were able to provide lunches with parents and during tech, like we would take a break from the morning child care and then have lunches. We were able to um, have support for, we, we had a BIPOC centered production. So support to, because it took a little longer to find the people we were looking for because they had barriers even to getting to auditions. They had barriers because they had day jobs. So knowing, 
knowing that we would have to make changes to the process so that they could be there and making those changes to the process. Um, so those were two extraordinary times that I have to be honest, I, I never thought that was possible. I felt when I had my little one, like I was such a burden and they made me feel like just such a gift to be in the room. And that is how I would, that is a standard now that has been set that I will not come down from. I love that when people standard set for us, right? Um, I had an agent, the first person I told outside of my family was my agent and he was like thrilled. And from that point, having that experience, you do set that standard. You're like, oh, anything less is wrong. <laughs> it's absolutely wrong. I just wanna share with everyone on this call, even if you're not a caregiver and you are seeking access, you're seeking support um, and someone gives it to you enthusiastically, let them be the standard bearer for you, as Tamanya said, um, that should absolutely be the expectation for our community. Uh, I want to share from the chat, um, Christy, I love that your infant daughter could come to tech with you and rehearsals were accommodated with your schedule with nursing, all the things. Yes, huge support. And Allison was the director on that show. Allison Heishman, everybody. What a human being. Um, huge yes. And just uh, Tamanya, I love that you mentioned that. What we have found at PAL is it's not, it's not a direct correlation between great support and huge resources. It's actually very often the other way around. And a large part is because these larger institutions are so um, built on a legacy system that when access needs to be created, systemic barriers need to be dismantled, such as racism, misogyny, um, the way it's always been done, a production calendar that can't be adjusted, that providing resources feels prohibitive. And then when you have organizations that are smaller, they know that they survive by asking the question, what do you need? What do I need? And that's our first offer for those who are wanting to be an ally. You're not required to know everything on how to support a caregiver if you don't have those experiences. But a great asset for you is to say, oh, what do you need? How can I help? If you have a caregiver showing up 10, 15 minutes late, they're not a messy human being. There's someone who needs to hear the question, what do you need? How can I help? Um, for the caregivers on the call, when you experience like caregiver barriers, being able to express what I need is X is a wonderful muscle to strengthen and to practice. And I know the discrimination is very real. We're going to get to that, but we still deserve to have a strong um, ask muscle of being able to ask for those things. We deserve to have that part feel very strong. Um, yes, the examples of support gives ideas on how to recommend to artists with families who you work with, especially in the music industry. Whoa, music, yes. Yeah, huge, huge, huge. Um, Tamani actually threw me a beautiful ball there with the standard. <laughs> um, the standard where we're going to share our, our new standard of care. Oh, I just love the chat though. Um, asking can sometimes be the barrier. Some artists feel shame asking for what they need. 100%. Our number one recommendation at PAL um, came from that Lort Residency, uh, Women's Leadership in Lort Residency Theaters research study. Um, one of the co-researchers is on our advisory board um, named Inika Cedar. And when I asked her, you know, what if, if, if we only changed one thing with PAL, like for our lifetime, what is the one thing that you think is foundational for there to be change? And she said, the obligation of starting the conversation needs to come off of the individual and put on the institution or the entity with power. And that's the biggest shift that can happen for us in any way. Now there are HR recommendations around that. You cannot ask someone's childcare plans in an interview. It is discrimination, et cetera. But what we're talking about is the obligation for creating support needs to come off of the individual with the need and go on to the organization or the institution or the individual with the power to gather the resources. Um, yes, starting the conversation before the caregiver has to is transformational. Um, yeah, and Tamani, feel free to jump in with these things too, because they're brilliant. I don't need to read your words. You're amazing. Um, that, that also leads us to belonging. Whenever there are points of access, there are people who feel they do not belong. Just to, you know, harken back to Gigi using the word disinvited. 
it doesn't even require someone to tell a caregiver, you're not professional enough to be in this environment. Just not having visibility or representation or access is enough to communicate to an individual, I don't belong here. Whether that's an, an intentional message or not, that is the message. And that applies to every point of the intersectional realities. It's, it's, uh, it expands with every intersectional reality as well. Um, and on that, I'd love to share my screen and invite Tamania to walk us through these points. What I have here is you mentioned the, the word standard, how developed a new standard of care for caregivers um, as a movement of ethical support for caregivers um, expected in 2021 and beyond. We say we don't help out with glory projects anymore. We're only interested in helping people pilot initiatives, which means they're committed to growing it. And for um, caregivers, this can help us know how and why we ask for what we need. For allies, it can help you know the why and how of showing that support. So we have three pillars of justice and 11 action steps. And um, I'll invite Tamani to share with us what they're built on. Um, yes, so this is part of the work that makes me uh, so excited to work with Pal. Um, as we go on this journey of providing support and providing a model, um, because we have one of, one of the little gorgeous links up here is the handbook. We have this incredible handbook, which has plans and statistics and all of the information if you want to start supporting um, caregivers or if you want to advocate for yourself. But one of the great things, one of the best things is it is rooted in um, is anti-oppression work and anti-racism work and inclusion and making sure that everyone has has a space and so I want to just read this first one you cannot have an anti-racist organization without formal caregiver support uh, and a big piece of that and we have again we have data below we have uh, articles we have all sorts of things is that um, caregiving uh, disproportionately falls to people who are femme presenting and people of color and there are many systemic reasons for that. But essentially, if you want to say, I don't want people of color in your organization without saying, I don't want people of color in my organization, do not provide caregiver support. Because that is literally saying one of the things that is probably central to the life of so many people of color, so many BIPOC individuals is caregiving and is the, the weight of that and is the um, expectation that we will do that labor for free because often there's either no one else to do it or culturally, you know, the femme presenting people have been have been told that they need to do it or um, because we have the healthcare system is uh, is a tragedy for many of us and it can be so destructive to our families in so many different ways. So um, so again, if if you want to do the anti-racist work, which uh, we are in a in a place where so many organizations are you must include caregiver support. That, that is simply one of the building blocks. And it is, again, we, we have so many resources here laid out in our handbook. I know Rachel just popped that in the chat. So to the next one, um, you cannot have gender parity or gender inclusion without formal caregiver support. As I just said in the point before, because so often that falls onto the shoulders of him presenting people. And because it is very hard uh, in this industry that was built for white cis head men to, to thrive, um, if you want to create, recreate your environment to be one where people can thrive who are not in that very narrow slice of the world, then there has to be formal caregiver support. And what we say by formal is, um, we were actually doing a pal talk just a few days ago, and we were talking about how um, informal policies only typically benefit white cis people. So if you say, oh, we can bring in our kids, if, if we need a day to bring in our kids, great. When the white um, father brings someone in, he's a great father, when he brings their kid in because the day ended early, say. Um, when I, a Latin a woman, brings in my child, I'm unprofessional. As Rachel said, I'm messy. I don't know how to plan effectively. Um, so by formal, we mean actually in policy, written down with steps that are very clear and provides access to everyone. And in theater, when we say everyone, so often these policies are created for the admin staff, for the people who work in the building, um, and they are not accessible to people like performers, directors, designers. And even if they are accessible to those people, then they aren't accessible to people who say work in the box office, people who are volunteers. So we're talking about top to bottom, every tier has access to this policy. It is written down, it is inclusive, and it is built 
with the people who it will be impacting from go. This is another thing that we always talk about. You have to talk to the people who are closest to the issue you're trying to address. You have to give them agency and you have to give them the ability to make decisions. So that is a huge part of it. Instead of a board who has one set of goals in mind, you have to bring in and pay, pay people who can consult with you um, about what caregivers need as you're building, as you're building this new anti-racist network or anti-racist policy. And finally, you cannot support reproductive rights without formal caregiver support. Um, this is another one that, uh, and, and again, when we talk about caregiver support, we're talking about people, and it says it here, people who are going through IVF, people who are going through pregnancy loss, people who are going through um, adoption. There are many ways that families are built. So recognizing that those all those all are part of the caregiving package. And, and also caregivers, caregivers of people with disabilities, caregivers of elders, all, all kinds of caregiving. Um, to, so to support reproductive rights, we have to look at the whole picture of what reproductive rights looks like and know that each person in that picture is going to need something different. So again, consulting with people and paying them for that consultation and making sure that when we say, you know, we are pro this or we are supportive of that, we're not just supporting a human when they're pregnant. We're supporting a human under, with the understanding that whatever comes after that pregnancy, we are supporting that as well. So again, and, and that's why pregnancy loss is on here. So often people say, well, how are we, you know, what, how does caregiver support relate to pregnancy loss? And it's because it's part of the journey. And, and so many of us, honestly, because of the shame involved in pregnancy loss, so many of us don't talk about the fact that we have one or two or five miscarriages. And so that has to be part of the conversation. We have to remove shame from talking about it and we have to center it just like the rest of the caregiving journey. Awesome, thank you so much, Tamarnia. I'm gonna share this into the chat. Um, this is from an article, um, Parents of Color and the Need for Anti-Racist Theater Practices. It was written by uh, Nicole Brewer, who's the founder of um, Anti-Racist Theater Training, Conscientious Theater Training. Um, she's a part of our board of directors now. Um, and she shares, when we view systemic inequity through the lens of race and racism, our anti-oppression practice remains rooted in oppressive values and inactive language. Um, this article that she shares, which um, I'll share a link to, talks about how you know, we have had organizations tell us before, um, we don't have time to work on the caregiver issue right now because we're working on racism. And just the fact that they are compartmentalizing those two realities and dividing um, individuals need for access that way uh, is a, a clear path to failed access points. Because the reason they're called intersectional realities is because there are multiple needs for access that exist within the bodies of people. And, um, and the system will compound the need for access um, or it can compound the, the provision of support, depending. Um, one of our favorite things to share is this EEO statement. Um, and this is what we talked about, like making it formal. And yes, I promise you're like, well, yes, organizations should do this, but what does it have to do with me now that I'm waiting for them to do all these things? I promise we'll connect it back to the individual, but part of the empowerment is knowing where to set that standard, right? What sort of expectation should you set for yourself on how should you be taking care of me? Um, I just invite folks to read the EEO statement. Uh, I can read it out loud for those watching the recording um, and to type into the chat something that is uncommon that's included here. Um, it says, we do not discriminate upon, based upon race, religion, color, national origin, sex, parentheses, including pregnancy, childbirth, reproductive health decisions, or related medical conditions, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, age, status as a protected veteran, status as an individual with a disability, genetic information, political views or activity, or other applicable legally protected characteristics. It's very long-winded, but um, just you can type like a word or a phrase um, in there that feels not as common. I feel like we've all seen EEO statements, but what perhaps is unique here.
Do you mind if my chat's blocking it? <laughs> so many. The explicit explanation of what sex discrimination entails, pregnancy, et cetera, for starters. 100%. Um, and legally binding. One of the things that I think we enter this caregiver situation not knowing is that even federal law protects us better than many of our artistic institutions. I don't think I've seen political views on the on a list before either. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll never forget the first time I was reaching out to some uh, people who had been involved in union governance for uh, for actors and stage managers, and I was sharing some of the stories that had been shared with me privately when I was first forming PAL, um, and many of them included uh, people being fired for being pregnant, and I knew it was a problem, it was an issue. But I'll never forget the person who, um, and she she runs an abortion advocacy group. Uh, actually, and part of the reason I reached out to her because I was like, you've been talking about reproductive rights for a long time. And I shared, you know, like even being fired for being pregnant and she just interrupts me flat out. And she goes, that's illegal. I was like, oh yeah, right. And she goes, that's illegal. Like they can't, they can't do that. And I was like, oh, right. And I just felt my brain go click, click, click where in one part of my brain, I knew that that was against the law. And in another part of my brain, I knew that that was happening to artists. But because of our lack of dialogue and conversation, I had not connected the two. That discrimination, something like, oh, this is a problem we can solve. But if even the federal government is further along with how to protect people, rather than our artistic institutions, we're very behind. Um, one of my favorite reveals, ta-da, is that this EEO statement does not come from a liberal organization by any means. Um, it was, if not now, it was at one point the EEO statement of Facebook, um, a very <laughs> commercial, capitalistic, global organization um, that is not so much human-centric, so much as that is based on self-interest, one could say, and like admittedly so, because it's based on profits. Um, and yet it includes a statement that um, is more explicit in the people it is designed to protect because of its knowledge of the rights and the law, which we invite. Um, yes, one of, uh, another one of my favorite parts is now to invite Tamanya to share with us a bit. Um, uh, I'll invite you all to share into the chat in reading through this. I would love to hear what comes to mind for you if this is what can happen on a larger scale um, what are some of the ways that we ourselves can either um, advocate for ourselves, advocate for others, or even change the way that we frame this conversation with ourselves about our experiences? So self-advocacy internally, self-advocacy professionally, or advocacy for others. One thing that comes to your mind, and I'd love to invite Tamanya to talk about um, ways that we can support each other as individuals rather than institutions. Um, I know something that is um, very specific to theater, but I'm sure to other industries as well, is we don't always have an in-house HR person. We don't always have someone who can interpret the law and who can interpret um, policy and things like that. So I think one way we can support is um, we can educate ourselves about what is federally mandated that we have to have in, in an organization. And um, I, I do some things like, and I have to say, I have the privilege when I'm a director, often I have more power in the room than other people like the designers and then the actors. Um, I put it directly into my contract often. Um, so I will, so people, I've gotten contracts to say things like we must strictly adhere to a schedule. There can be no, you know, there can be no changes to the schedule, things like that. And I'll say, um, Okay, great. So we will strictly adhere to the schedule, except should a, a Tamanya is a full time caregiver, should she have an emergency or should anyone, including designers, actors, day laborers, volunteers, da, 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 admin staff, have a, an emergency, da, 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 we will make the best accommodations we can that will honor her ability to caregive or language like that. 
Um, and so often people are just very surprised. They're like, why do you need to include everyone else in this contract? I'm like, because of the, the privilege I hold, um, I need to, I need to protect those people who maybe don't have the same bargaining privilege that I do. So educating ourselves and putting it in places like our contract, um, making that uh, assumption. Sometimes when I donate to theaters, I say, oh, this is for your caregiving fund. And they'll come back to us and say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have a caregiving fund. And I'll say, great, I would love to talk to you about why or why not. So um, voting with our dollars, like, you know, making sure that people have a caregiving fund. Um, and then, you know, asking ourselves in every situation, I know, Rachel, you've told stories about this, and I have stories about this. Uh, consider the cost of childcare every minute you're asking an artist to be in the room. And how does that impact a stipend you can give them? How does that impact grants you can request? How does that impact uh, what you can offer in the audition room? I remember in the audition room for Cry It Out, Allison, the producer who we talked about, Allison literally stood outside and said, I can hang on to your kiddo for five minutes. And in other situations, we actually, if it, we needed longer care, we had um, people who were hired that had insurance and all that kind of thing. But just considering what is someone literally doing with the people they are caregiving for in the moments so where I'm asking them to be in the room. I know, um, Rachel, you've discussed things like avoiding drop off and pick up and school holidays just deciding that's not going to be on the rehearsal schedule from go instead of having to rework the schedule later. Say, we will not work on these days. And that is because caregivers will probably have their little ones home and the cost will be you know, much higher for them to find caregiving or possibly much higher. Um, I think another thing we can do is talk about it. As I said, I felt a great deal of fear and shame when I had a little one. And while being able to protect yourself, some people have more access to you know, be able to talk about it and not. Um, show yourself to be a parent, make it known that you are a parent and, you know, offer, uh, try to create a community where you need it. Ask for things like affinity spaces, ask for, you know, time before and after to, to meet with people that might have questions about how you have navigated the childcare in the space, especially people who are from out of town. Ask if there can be a pamphlet, as Rachel talked about, of not just here's childcare, but here's ERs, here's museums that you can go to, here's all of these things um, and be very considerate of COVID policies. There are still children who cannot get vaccinated and being very, I, I know that in the last few years when I've been asked to work in rooms, it's like, we have a great policy. Be very clear about what that great policy is. Are you requiring vaccines? Will there be masks backstage that are N95 or an equivalent? Um, will there be hand sanitizer? Will actors be asked to remove their masks or not? Um, so just being very, very explicit about COVID policies. And again, just considering parents or caregivers often have medically, medically um, fragile people in their homes. So how would you deal with someone with that knowledge? And I think all of that, those pieces stacked on together, that's where we can start as individuals. And contact PAL. Like I, like I said, I'm the chief rep for Philadelphia. I'm happy to answer any questions or to pass you on to some very informed person or organization who can answer your questions, either how can I advocate for myself, how can I make sure I'm safe, or how can I make sure that my organization is making thoughtful change. Yes, and thank you so much. Um, I dropped Tamanya's email in the chat, as well as um, Tamanya's support email. Um, we have someone supporting Tamanya's uh, calendar and conversation. This is a real offer. We love engaging with individuals um, who need uh, just even a sounding board, if not someone to talk to, if you have a contract to negotiate, or um, if you haven't had professional opportunities, or you want to increase your professional opportunities, and you want to find a path that will be supportive for you, um, we're here for that dialogue. Because um, also to encourage you all, this is to empower everyone who hears it, and not to recruit you to die on the hill of visible caregiving. <laughs> like That is not your job. Is the systemic change is uh, all of us as a community working together, but we want you safe first and foremost. Um, so advocate to, to the expanse of your safety. Um, and if you need to expand that safety, we're happy to chat with you. Um, yeah, we're really, we're really excited to share. Uh, I will share the screen for the handbook. Um, when you go to 
paaltheater.com slash handbook. It will ask you for an email address. It's free. That's just to help us understand who's accessing uh, this resource. Um, but this is a handbook that we've been putting together for the past six, seven years. Um, it includes interviews with leadership. It includes HR resources on what constitutes discrimination, what to do when you face a certain kind of discrimination. Um, but it also has chapters on how to create a caregiver stipend fund, um, how to advocate for family supportive scheduling. Um, and you can even go to here and uh, find the categories that you need um, on how to ask for childcare in the work environment, um, case studies that we've done before, uh, fertility and planning. And we hope that these chapters will not only give you quick access to language that you need, but we also really encourage people that it's not your job to do your boss's homework either. So if someone's like, we don't, we don't know how to create a caregiver stipend, you come here, you grab the, type, the chapter and you email it to them and say, here's a link to get started. Here's an organization that can help you develop it. And then you go back to making your art. And that's our goal. Um, with this resource, um, I also want to talk about some more unconventional ways, something that, you know, Jasmine, we even talked about on our prep call is, you know, as allies and individuals, it's amazing how we can expand our communal responsibility and even gain our gain ground on our own access when we ask the question, what do you need? And I remember we were having the conversation where, you know, you even have friends who are caregivers or who have children. And we talk about even the networking opportunities or just having time for friends and going out. When you ask, you're like, you know, parents and caregivers get such a reputation for like, oh, they don't go out anymore. And it's probably because it costs them 20 to $25 an hour, including travel time not to mention the emotional labor and the physical labor. And is that person's body still healing? Um, is this an adopted child where they don't, they don't, they're not comfortable with new people? Is this a foster child where they're not comfortable with new people caring for them? Is this someone whose body is going through changes from IVF? That's not for us to investigate, but what is for us to investigate is what do you need? I'd love to see you more, or I'd love to come support you in your home, or I'd love to give you space, but we don't know what that person is looking for until we find the boldness to ask that question. And I love one of the, you just, Jasmine just like grabbed onto the solution so fast. She's like, so I could like help them pay for their babysitter if I wanted them to come out. And I was just like, if someone did that, I mean, best friends for life forever. I mean, let's say you have a friend group, right? And two or three out of the seven are parents now. And then like the seven of you all said like, hey, if we all pitch in, they can like uh, come out with us because then they can afford the childcare and then we all get to see each other again. And like, just make like a friend pot. And you know, if, if money is tight, do it like once a year, like help them celebrate a holiday or something. Um, but that's sort of, what's up Calvin? Um, that's sort of, uh, communal responsibility, which is a term Nicole Brewer uses often is invaluable because not only does it address the financial problem, but we become allies by saying explicitly, you belong. Even though we don't see you, you belong with us and we haven't forgotten you. You're a valid contributor to this community. Um, I think even as artists, knowing that the psychology of a caregiver, if we're to be allies to others and continue to empower ourselves, is to remember that just because we stop making things tangibly doesn't mean we stop being artists. And I think that's for all of us in this time of a pandemic, all of us going through a caregiver time, you are still an artist. Your, your identity of artistry is not defined by your output. It's not defined by your product. And if you can find the language to offer that to a caregiver artist, you know, by saying, if they're like, well, I'm, I'm not really an actor anymore because I mean, I haven't been in place in like 10 years because of my kids. Allow the person to identify how they want to identify, but just speak into their life. I still see you as an artist because I know that's what you're designed to do. Think about how would I want someone else to see me as someone who still identifies as an artist so that we don't let the barriers rob us of identity or rob our community of their identity because then they fall away. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna share some stuff from the chat and invite Tamani to share on that as well. 
So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to offend or step on toes. Oh, I'm so glad it's helped your friend group. Yes, even planning the night for them, making sure they have a great night out. Girls' night more meaningful, 100%. At the end of the day, you don't have to know how to care for kids or care for elders. If you know how to care for the caregiver, that's the impact. That's huge. That's the impact, 100%. Yeah, agreed to money. That's world changing. Um, yeah, Christy, I'm just a different kind of artist now, for sure. Um, we have a wonderful blog series um, on our, uh, let's see, Powered Press. Let me find it. Um, oh, it's on our website under blog. We have a wonderful series happening right now um, where uh, our contributing rep, Catherine Miller, is sharing insights as what art can look like in the realm of domesticity um, and creating like from the place of clown, from the place of joy um, and crafts and things like that. And it's just P-A-A-L theater.com slash blog. And um, there are some, I'll share my screen so that you can see really kind of the, some of the magical insights. It's called the mama's column because she has a community called mother artists making art. And it is to um, directly support femme identifying artists to engage with the artists that they are um, using the resources that they have. Um, and it's, there's this one article called Everyone Needs a Jane. So this picture is from talking about how in the postpartum life, we all need someone to advocate for us so that our energy can be spent resting. Um, yeah, I see as an artist because that's what you're designed to do. I mean, it's, it's what we all need to hear, right? It's not unique to caregivers. Um, yeah, so throwing the ball back to Tamani to share about those individual affirmations and what, what they can mean. Um, I first want to say, Jasmine, you're an incredible friend. Thank you for thinking of that. Um, yeah, I think then I remember I read an article, I, I wish I could remember where it was from, that said um, parents in, in COVID are not okay. Um, just start from that we are not okay. Like literally every moment of every day, we're trying to keep our kid alive in a world and a country and often in certain states that is not helping us very much or that is providing very confusing um, some, you know, very confusing policies, or even, um, you know, is, is actively working against us keeping our kids healthy. So our, so much of our, our day is literally keeping our, our people that we are caregiving for alive. Um, and I think the friends that have been the most supportive in this time, um, and also just in my whole, you know, caregiving journey, are the parents, are the people who literally let me like disappear for eight months and then come back and like support that and just celebrate me. Um, the, the people that like you're saying, Jasmine, think of the labor that they can do in a very like low key way. I'm not talking about like come and move me into a new house. I'm talking about just very low key, like, um, hey, I'd like to see you. I scouted out these three places that have outdoor stuff for kids with the, you know, that the COVID policies, you have to wear a mask. Can we go? Um, or, or even offering not to bring my kid. Like I love my little one, but um, offering like, hey, I would love to do a Zoom with you and your little one, but also can we have a call after that? Just you and me. Um, so respecting that we as caregivers need some space where we're not caregiving too. Um, but just, yeah, just knowing that, that that labor is taking care of for you is huge. And like that can sometimes be the barrier that's high enough for me not to go. Um, another thing that people have done is um, check on me, but like legit really check on me. Like not just sort of say like, hey, I hope you're well, blah, blah, blah. but say like, um, I know you're going through it with the new mask policy right now, or I know you're having a rough time with, you know, hospitals and your, and your dad, like, I'm just here. I just want you to know I love you. Like the, I have three or four friends that literally just randomly sometimes are like, I love you. That's all. You can write back or you can not write back to me, but I just need you to know I love you. And if you want to talk, I'm here. And if not, you're just an amazing person. That's it. Like just the care in that of knowing that like in that moment, I'm probably in the depths of the depths trying to do my best. And that can really like push me up. Um, That's incredible. So just legit check on people and legit give them space to not be happy and not be ha put a happy face on because having to be like the flotation device that is keeping a family or, or a child or you know someone vulnerable alive right now 
is a lot. There's so much. And as someone who is creative, it can steal from your creativity in a big way if you aren't refilled with like love and joy. Um, I have a friend who sends me stupid memes, like the very stupidest memes and TikToks you can imagine with no explanation. They're just like, boop, 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 TikTok. And I'm like, what is this lovely little gift? And I open it at two in the morning when I'm doing my emails. We were talking earlier. That's when parents do their emails. <laughs> um, and I just like laugh like some sort of like horse or something as loud as I can at two in the morning in my office. Um, and, but that's, you know, that's what we need sometimes. So um, yeah, I think as you're saying, doing labor, doing um, sending articles. I have a friend that literally just sends me articles. It's like, here's the change to the, you know, mask policy. Here's what the school district is doing right now, because we could do a whole, a whole zoom on the, the wild stuff going on in the Philly school district right now. Um, so literally just like this is information you might need. Hey, here, here you go in case you don't have time to look for it. Um, so there's those very tiny moments of care that show me like they know where I'm at and they know I need help and they know that I love my little one, but sometimes I also need to be an adult. Like those are huge. Those are really huge. And my friends that know I can't go to their shows, um, when I send them like happy opening nights or happy whatever, and they're like, I know you would be here if you could, I love you. You know, like that's huge too. Like recognizing that in COVID times, I want with all my body to be in some of those spaces and I can't because I have people that I need to keep safe. Amazing. Thank you, Tamanya. Jasmine, I want to just acknowledge the time and just check in with you on what, what we're looking at um, for time sign off. This is usually when we do it, you know, just a Q&A of anything in the room, but I know that it's been a wonderfully active chat to share. So um, either direction that feels like it's right to, to go in is, is fine with us. 720. Um, is this session until eight or 730? 40 minutes. Great. Um, and it's okay. I think if we don't use the full time because it's a, such an intimate group. So I'd love to invite um, if there are any questions about resources or something you've engaged with, or whether it's a conversation talking point, that's a bit sticky um, or a question on how you can support uh, the caregivers in your life. I'd love to invite that. Um, into the space as well. Uh, you can drop it into the chat. We're happy to engage with it. And I'll also drop our social handles as well, because we'd love to continue connecting with all of you. And if you don't mind, Jasmine, if it's okay to ask you a question, I know something that um, I I wondered about being so deep in the caregiving, you know, life. Um, what surprised you maybe about caregivers or parents in your life during during this last couple of years? Um, and you know, if I don't know, I guess just that, like, what surprised you most about the caregivers in your life? Yeah, so um, what surprised me, one, was how much my friends kept to themselves, like how much they needed, and I was so unaware of that. Um, the lack of dialogue, the lack of, is this question okay to ask you? Um, understanding when someone says, oh, I need to I need to have a check to if my mom can watch them, that's a cue for you to be like, oh, well, do you need support? How can I assist you? It kind of just gets quiet after that kind of comment. So just like how my conversations have graduated from, ooh, how do I do this? Or to, hey, let's figure out how to support you. Um, let me reach out to such and such and let's see if we can cash up this person. Or, oh, my mom is not working that day. Can we see if she wants to take care? So just kind of like being more resourceful to my friends. Um, another thing that surprised me was how, not, not surprising, but like, the amount of effort, like it's exhausting. And you are you still wanna go out? Like you still wanna hang out? You wanna be out till four in the morning cause you wanna have a good time? It's like just understanding the resilience of a parent and never underestimating them. Don't, don't think that you're gonna overwhelm them. Like don't think that they can't take it. Don't think that they can't re reorganize. Like I have a friend that gets her son up at 6 a.m. and has to convince him that it's morning and that he does have to get up. <laughs> 
<laughs> because he's so articulate. He's like, no, it's dark, mom. And I even will call her like at 6 30 and be like, did Solomon get up? Put me on speaker. Get up. <laughs> get up because I'm up and so just learning how to kind of be like an, a fake aunt and just be more like just just show up um I love how you all mentioned balance because I did get a little too crazy and I was like let's go here we can bring him let's go here we can bring her and one of they were like girl I just want to go out for drinks we don't have to bring them and I'm like oh <laughs> okay but um and then also just being a trustworthy person like not everybody deserves to be around your kids like that's a privilege to invite people into your family um and then just honoring that opportunity like kids like just families in general grandparents mothers um they are a part of that person and that can be dear to them so just honoring and being respectful of those of those interactions and honoring the fact they may remember your name um or they may not but they may remember your energy you know and just taking note of what family can take from that. So I, I hope I answered that. Um, and I also wanted to just chime in on something like, I'm not sure, I wanted to get your opinion on the difference between women or women that are those that identify as women versus men or those that identify as male and how they receive this information of asking for what you need. Because in my experience, I feel like we as women or those that identify as women, we're very vocal. We're like, no, I need this. And we can speak on that, but I'm, I'm noticing there's a barrier for my male group friends that are like, I have a child and I'm late for rehearsal because I cannot get in contact with the mother of my child. And they have shame. And I mean, in guilt. And it's not, it, it doesn't seem like they feel like they can be seen. So how, how do we support those artists? And it doesn't just have to be for the men, but those that feel like it's shameful to say, I have, I, I can't make it because of my child, like getting rid of that shame um, and supporting them with articulating what that need might be. Um, Rachel, if you don't mind, I, 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 I can speak to this a little for sure. Um, I, I think certainly uh, as, as women, we are taught to communicate. We are taught that there's a strength in communicating. We have a lot of um, experience with it. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's literally like a skill that some men or male presenting people do not have or were never taught or was never valued, you know, like, so like, I remember going up, people would be like, oh, you're chatty like a girl, like stop, you know what I mean? Or like stuff like that, where it's just like, let that man speak. Like, can, can he just talk? Like what, what's female about talking? So I think certainly there's a, there's a barrier of, um, feeling that there's something wrong with communicating and then asking for help. That's a goal that. I think so many men, caregivers or not, really struggle with. Um, so I think that what I found um, in my rehearsal process, the rehearsal process for Cry It Out, where I specifically was censoring people of color, I remember we tried to practice something that I like to call radical grace. And that was every time someone isn't meeting an expectation or is late or didn't do something on time, instead of coming to them with the shame of professionalism and um, perfectionism that is rooted in white supremacy. It's like, how can I support you? This is a, this is a, this is a, you know, need for more support. What can I do? Like, tell me. And often I found, especially with men, because they're so action oriented, it's a very specific offer. Instead of saying like, what do you need? And trying to like pull that out. Cause that's such a big, like, well, I mean, the list is very long, you know, like, like, Hey, you were late. I can offer these three things. You know, like I know that my caregiver maybe can take another kid or I know that, you know, like maybe we can start rehearsal 30 minutes later because if pickup time is, is too close, um, you know, or I know maybe we can rehearse on on this time on Saturdays instead of Tuesdays or, you know, so like I think very specific, very specific offers. Um, I know, especially when my family was going through medical crises, and I, I don't want to embarrass Rachel, but she was a part of this email, I would, I would sort of just send out these very distressed emails, like this horrible thing is happening, I'm not getting listened to in the healthcare community, and, and, you know, the caregivers who especially were nurses or doctors or adjacent would send back like, this is what you can ask for. This is what in the ER you are, you know, they're required to give you. This is the name of the test they should have done. And so I think that offering that very specific support can be like life-changing. Um, I think another thing too is like naming it out in the room. Like, hey, I, I know that um, it can be hard to ask for help and maybe that wasn't, that's not something that's been, you know, 
that, that you feel like it, uh, it's safe to do with me, but I don't think your professionalism is informed by your ability to, to get, to get a babysitter, you know, or to get, to get your baby's mom on the phone. Like that, that has nothing to do with your desire to be here. That's logistics. So if I can help with that, great. If there's something I can do in the schedule, great. But that does not, one does not inform the other. They're not related. So breaking that link, I think too, always makes me feel good when people are like, um, yeah, you're an incredible artist. You're not less of that because you're trying to care give. Like you're just, you're just a human who has more on their plate. So, and, and I will toss it to Rachel if there's anything specific. You yeah, but it's something that you say all the time. <laughs> like in addition to those brilliant points, um, Tamanya also speaks um, uh, a lot about modeling. And I think that I, or I know that as a caregiver, I have felt uh, much safer in spaces where people model transparency about their own needs around me. Um, especially people who had greater positions of power. Now we know that sometimes leadership is like, I'm going to use the space to complain because no one can fire me. And that's a very different thing than, than us saying, you know, like we say in the pal calls, hi, we're entering this space. I have a five and a seven-year-old. They may show up on the screen. I know that as the facilitator of the conversation, I have, I have a, some sense of power and agency on the call. So if I speak about my own disruption, and I, and I claim it without shame and I name it, then my hope is that in modeling that without anyone else having to, um, having to ex exploit or expose themselves as potentially having that disruption, they're like, oh, me, me too. Like that may happen to me as well in, in one way or another. And they know, well, if the facilitator is going to own it, maybe I can as well. So that's sort of modeling where if we're around our friends and let's say we've asked, what do you need? Or, and we've given examples of like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good a way to offer that like our needs don't make us less is to share once in a while about our own needs. Like I needed this and someone supported me. And I just love having that conversation of how can we be there for each other? Just let me know anytime I can be for you because I know that really helped me. And then it, it equalizes the power dynamic. The caregiver doesn't feel like they're going to be the only needy one in the conversation, but that having needs is a human experience, not just a caregiver experience that we all can benefit from that conversation. And I think to add to that too, part of this like radical grace, you know, philosophy of mine is um, you don't owe me your trauma. Cause sometimes I feel like when, when you're coming, you're like, my mom didn't show up or, you know, my, there was a car accident away. And I just say to people like, you don't owe me, you can tell me whatever you need, but you do not owe me your trauma. There is not a place where I'm like, oh, that's important. You can, yes, you can be late for that. Everything is important. Whatever is going on in your life is important. So like, you don't have to tell me more than you want to tell me exactly what you think is right. And I will honor it regardless of what the content is. So I think that's, that feels safe too, because I think especially BIPOC, we feel like we have to sort of like give enough details to make our struggle important or to make our struggle valuable. And I just tell people like, nope, you're valuable. Your struggle is valuable. That's it. We're starting from there. So whatever more you need to give me to inform our interaction, great. But I don't need to know anything you don't want to tell me that's that's your privacy and 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 because it re-traumatizes us even just to tell those stories sometimes like I know when I was talking about needing off for my dad or needing off because my dad had an accident or something um it was incredibly traumatizing to have to explain to my boss at the time or the HR at the time um so I always try to create a space and and that's not just like needing off but like in general in your life you don't owe me your trauma you know you 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 just ask for what you need and all needs are equal as far as I'm concerned. Thank you ladies so much. I really appreciated uh, you all sharing those opinions and really resonating with me. And once again, just more ideas that I can continue to implement among my friend group. And also just like empowering myself too, because there's I, I I always over explain because I already know they're already judging me so <laughs> they already declared I was going to be late all the time so you know and I, and so thank you if this is empowering in so many ways thank you so much Jasmine for creating this space and just for being such a um just being so ready to engage with the conversation from the perspectives that you have it and it was 
I've, I've learned so much having this dialogue with you. So it's, it's been a real treat and thank you truly. And for modeling that like caregiving isn't just the business of caregivers, like it's our community, you know, relies on caregivers in so many ways that like it's our community, like let's all, you know, let's all be part of that conversation. 100%. And thank you to everyone who showed up and who watches this back later. Thank you for showing up for yourselves and for others. Yes, thank you to everyone who participated today. And thank you for those that are watching the replay. And if this is something that resonated with you, please share this with fellow artists with families or fellow allies that you think could benefit from these very useful resources. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Rachel and Tamanya for joining us this evening and facilitating such a safe space, not just for artists with families, but just for artists in general. There were some tidbits that could be transferable Write your own contracts, put in there what you need, um, be vocal, and also find that balance between showing up as an ally and then showing up as a friend. That's, I think that's beautiful. Um, so thank you both so much for these takeaways. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>